What's up folks? So today I'm going to take things in a slightly different direction and talk about dandruff. I want to go over my own history with dandruff, talk about what dandruff is exactly, and go over some of the mechanisms of dandruff. And then after that I want to outline some treatments and then go over what I do specifically to fight my own dandruff. So. I have had issues with dandruff that predate even my battle with hair loss. I first noticed dandruff problems when I was in high school, and it made me insecure enough to the point where I would do things to hide it. I would do things like wear hats, I would avoid wearing dark colored shirts in fear of flakes showing up on my clothing, and I also experimented with a lot of uh, naturopathic, aka snake oil, topical oils, and tried to treat the condition on my own until I finally sought out a dermatologist who gave me some insight into what dandruff is, what causes it, and what I could do to treat my own dandruff. So first, sorry, I had a little bit of a stuffy nose though there. So what is dandruff? Well, we understand dandruff as being the nasty flakes that build up in our scalp and ruin the cosmetic appearance of our hair. It is highly multifactorial, meaning that its causation can be due to many singular or multiple issues. These causes can include the fungus of our scalp, scalp diseases like seborrheic dermatitis, as well as environmental factors such as the use of certain shampoos, exposure to the elements, and even the use of cosmetic products, including topical hair loss treatments like minoxidil. And I'll get into that uh, towards the end of the video. So, in most cases, uh, dandruff consists of clumps of what are known as corneocytes, which are the dead cells that make up the outermost layer of the skin on the scalp. Now, like I said, there are many conditions that can cause dandruff. Like in some cases, it is due to inflammation. Uh, for example, seborrheic dermatitis, like I mentioned, is what causes the red patches and itchiness on the scalp, along with the dandruff that causes uh, dandruff in many people. Uh, and the cause of derma seborrheic dermatitis, it's not 100% understood, but it seems to be related to a yeast infection of the scalp or problems with the immune systems. So the yeast that causes seborrheic dermatitis is called malassezia. It is present on the scalps of pretty much everyone, but in the case of people with dandruff, it is a bit more common with levels roughly 1.5 to two times higher than people without dandruff. This suggests at first that this yeast, which is a kind of fungus, may play a role in ordinary dandruff production as well as dandruff caused by seborrheic dermatitis. However, does one thing we have to consider is does the yeast cause the dandruff or is the yeast just there as a byproduct? product of the dandruff. It's possible that the yeast just takes advantage of the dandruff that is already present there since the yeast is known to grow on dandruff. And what this means is that the more dandruff you have, the more yeast will grow or the yeast may be causing the dandruff. It's difficult to say. So if you do have seborrheic dermatitis, which is probably caused by yeast, using an antifungal shampoo like Nizoril might help. There is a blue version of Nizoril, which is 1% ketoconazole. That's the active ingredient. And that's available over the counter, uh, which could work. And failing that, you can opt for the red version of Nizoril, which has as 2% uh, ketoconazole. However, if you don't have seborrheic dermatitis as the cause of your dandruff, dandruff, these treatments may not be as effective. I mean, nobody should assume there is a one-size-fits-all treatment for dandruff. It's not that simple, unfortunately. Another factor that must be considered when treating dandruff is sebum production. So sebum is dependent on androgens, and sebum can contribute to dandruff because the yeast, which may play a role in dandruff, malassezia, tends to grow better in sebum-rich environments on the scalp. This hypothesis is further strengthened by the fact that dandruff is more common in men, and also due to the fact that dandruff is more common in younger men compared to older men whose androgen levels have naturally declined a bit over the years. However, arguing against this is the fact that sebum production in people with or without dandruff tends to be the same. So to account for this, researchers have hypothesized that there is a genetic factor behind dandruff formation from sebum production, which suggests individual hosts are simply more susceptible to dandruff. This can be compared to other androgen-dependent conditions like acne and androgenic alopecia, since sufferers and non-sufferers will typically have similar androgen levels, yet some will express symptoms of acne and hair loss while others will not. So simply put, dandruff is yet another shitty disease caused by DHT just like hair loss and large prostate and acne, so throw in yet another reason why DHT is a trash hormone as if we didn't already have enough reasons to hate it as it is. So speaking of DHT, which is the cause of male pattern baldness, one advantage of being bald, and I can't believe I'm saying this, is that bald people typically do not have as much or any dandruff since long hair tends to trap dandruff. Although you don't have to just shave it, bro. You can easily just keep your hair short to mitigate this problem. Uh, interestingly enough as well, there also seems to be another link between dandruff 
dandruff and androgenic alopecia. There was a survey of patients with androgenic alopecia with and without dandruff that showed that the dandruff sufferers tend to shed 100 to 300 hairs daily as opposed to the normal 50 to 100 hairs shed daily from the non-dandruff sufferers. This is probably why some people report benefits from antifungal ketoconazole shampoos like Nizoral because the yeast and the dandruff may cause inflammation, which itself isn't what causes hair loss, but it may make things worse. So this doesn't conclude Nizoral as some great treatment on par with the FDA-approved duo for hair loss, minoxidil and finasteride, but it may help, especially with people who have severe inflammation. And I made a video a few weeks ago on ketoconazole shampoos and hair loss, which I'll link below. So if you're interested in learning more about Nizoral for hair loss, I recommend watching that video. So fortunately, dandruff isn't like androgenic alopecia, where we have only a small handful of effective treatments. There are fortunately many over-the-counter dandruff treatments, which do work and are widely available, and we're going to go over all of them. So the first class of treatments are keratinolytic agents. These work by dissolving the attachment between the corneocytes, which breaks up the clumps and allows the corneocytes to be washed away. An example of a keratinolytic ag agent would be salicylic acid, which is found in anti-danger shampoos like T-cell. Another keratinolytic agent is sulfur, and you may remember I talked about sulfur in my onion juice video, but fortunately you don't need to go juicing any onions if you want to treat dandruff, although theoretically maybe you could. A better option would be to get a shampoo like Cebelex, which has sulfur in it and also salicylic acid, so it has two clinically proven ingredients to treat dandruff, which is a pretty good deal. After keratinolytic agents, the next category of treatments are keratin regulators, and these work by reducing the keratinization of the epithelium, which is what forms the corneocytes, which in turn cause dandruff. An agent that does this is zinc pyrithion, and it's in many different dandruff shampoos, the most famous one probably being Head & Shoulders. And I'll just say I am a long-term user of Head & Shoulders, although I use a generic equivalent, which still has the 1% pyrithion zinc active ingredient in it. And I find it effective, but another interesting thing I have found about pyrithion zinc, it was just recently brought to my attention, is that pyrithion zinc may actually be beneficial in fighting androgenic alopecia. And uh, explaining this, there was a study done in 2003 involving 200 men aged 18 to 49 years old, and it showed that washing daily with a pyrithion zinc uh, shampoo resulted in an increase in hair count, which was about half of what the effect 5% minoxidil has. Unfortunately, when the minoxidil and pyrithion zinc were combined, it didn't show any synergistic benefits since there was no improvement from using minoxidil alone. However, I nevertheless felt this was an important important thing to bring up since many people either don't want to use minoxidil or they cannot for various reasons like if they're allergic to it. So in such a case, I think it might not be a bad idea to add head and shoulders or another pyrithion zinc shampoo into your daily hair loss routine. I mean, you have to shower anyway, so you might as well use something that helps, right? Also, compared to Nizoral, which is the shampoo that is popularly used by hair loss sufferers in many cases, I find that uh, Head and shoulders isn't nearly as harsh and is much better cosmetically for daily use compared to Nizoral. I mean, even the 1% variety of uh, Nizoral is really, really harsh on my scalp. And I find that if I use it any more than a couple times per week, it dries it out, leaves it very straw like, so I don't like it very much. But Moving on, let's talk about another keratin regulator that's on the market, and this one is tar. Now, I'm not talking about going out in the street and finding tar to put on your scalp. I'm talking about medicated shampoos that contain tar. A popular example of this would be the T-Gel shampoos. Uh, I think Neutrogena makes one, and there are also a lot of generics of the shampoo available on the market which have the same active ingredient but are cheaper, so that would probably be a better choice. And Having used these, in my experience, uh, this is probably one of the best anti-dandruff shampoos on the market. The big drawback, however, is that it's kind of smelly, so it might help to cycle it with another shampoo, like Head & Shoulders, or maybe uh, use it in combination with a nice fragrant conditioner afterwards to help prevent your hair from smelling like a sewer. I mean, it works, but it makes your head stink, so I wouldn't consider this to be the first choice in the fight against dandruff. Now. The last category of anti-dandruff shampoos are antifungal shampoos. Now, of course, I already mentioned ketoconazole shampoos like Nizoral earlier, and these work because they are strong antifungals, which rather than preventing the buildup of corneocytes, they will instead directly kill the yeast that may cause the dandruff to begin with. It's particularly very useful if you have dandruff from conditions like seborrheic dermatitis, although other dandruff uh, shampoos may work for this condition as well. Now, this antifungal shampoo 
shampoo, uh, ketocon, uh, Nizoral, is generally considered to be very powerful, especially if we're talking about the 2% prescription red Nizoral. But the trade-off, like I already said, is that it's very drying to the scalp, uh, which makes it hard for regular use, and the 2% is even harsher than the 1%. And I find that if you are going to use Nizoral, what works is to just use it as needed. So what I mean by that is don't use it every day or as part of a routine every other day or every or even once a week. I mean, it's better just to use it when you notice your dandruff has gotten particularly bad and will help nuke it. So just use it as needed. Also, you can counter the dryness of Nizoral by just adding a nickel-sized drop of jojoba oil into your conditioner and then letting it sit after you lather it in your hair for about five minutes or so. I like jojoba oil because structurally, it's very similar to the sebum our scalp produces naturally. So I find it's a good way to counter the dryness without making things look too greasy, at least in the case of my scalp. So another uh, very obscure antifungal shampoo uh, ingredient, antifungal shampoo ingredient I should mention is called uh, Cyclopyrox, and it is similar to ketoconazole, but it works in a very different way. It's not any better or worse, but I felt that it was important to bring up in case somebody wants a strong antifungal shampoo but can't use ketoconazole due to allergies or availability based on where they live. So Getting back to something uh, less obscure as far as antifungal dandruff treatments go, let's talk about selenium. This is the active ingredient in Selsun Blue, or Selsun Blue, I should say, which I think is probably the second most well-known anti-dandruff shampoo brand behind Head & Shoulders. It's not just antifungal, though. It has some effect in reducing corneocyte proliferation and also has some anti seborrheic uh, properties. So it works on multiple fronts, which suggests this might be a good treatment for people who have dandruff and have haven't had success with other dandruff shampoos like Head & Shoulders. It's often compared and marketed directly against Head & Shoulders, but all the evidence suggests that they both work. I mean, which one is better is something that people just have to find out through their own experiences. As the reports vary and there has never really been any big clinical trials comparing the two directly, at least none that I know of. So bottom line is you can't go wrong with either, although I prefer Head & Shoulders because that is what I use first. It works for me, so I guess you can say I have some consumer bias, but I don't feel like uh, changing things up when, when I'm using something that already works, so that's why I'll probably just stick with head and shoulders or specifically a generic uh, variation of it. So let's say you have dandruff. Should you see a doctor? Well, dandruff is not a life-threatening issue, so there's nothing wrong with just trying to treat it yourself with over-the-counter products. But let's say your dandruff is really severe. Let's say you've tried the treatments like I already mentioned and you found them all to be ineffective. What do you do after that? Well, in that case, you probably do want to see a doctor, and the doctor can diagnose conditions to rule out the possibility of seborrheic dermatitis or other skin conditions which can cause dandruff. And also, the doctor can prescribe prescription strength uh, shampoos like the 2% Nizoral, uh, I already mentioned, or he can give you some prescription strength variant of another over-the-counter dandruff shampoo, like a, a stronger selenium shampoo, or basically just stronger versions of dandruff shampoos already on the market, like I already mentioned. So another thing the doctor may rule appropriate is prescribing topical corticosteroids, which may help dandruff due to inflammation. And like I always say, when in doubt, it's best to get a professional medical diagnosis. I mean, it never hurts to seek professional opinion. I mean, after all, I'm just some dude on the internet talking about hair loss and stuff. So the last thing I do want to talk about re regarding the subject of dandruff is something that looks like dandruff, but really isn't. I'm talking about minoxidil residue. When using minoxidil, either the foam or the liquid, what happens is that it will eventually dry out, and the inactive ingredients of minoxidil will leave this really disgusting uh, dandruff-looking residue flakes in your scalp that sadly can't be treated with conventional dandruff treatment. So because even though it looks like dandruff, it isn't really dandruff. It's just dried up minoxidil. So sadly, it's hard to distinguish between actual dandruff and minoxidil based dandruff. But if you are using dandruff treatments and find you still have flakes and you're on minoxidil, then chances are you're dealing with minoxidil flakes. So in my experience, here are some of the things you can do to stop minoxidil flakes. Number one, just don't start minoxidil. I mean, minoxidil is the best hair growth stimulant on the market and it's the only hair growth stimulant which is FDA approved which means it has hundreds of millions of dollars worth of research using clinical trials that involve thousands of subjects which prove that it works and 
It's a great treatment. It works differently from finasteride, so therefore it can be stacked with it for a combination therapy that gives a synergistic benefit. However, finasteride really should be your first choice, not minoxidil, because finasteride is better for long-term use since it goes after the underlying cause of male pattern baldness, which of course is DHT destroying the hair follicles. But also it's uh, better because... Uh, it's, it's better to be in a situation where you just have to take a pill to fight hair loss as opposed to having to apply a topical liquid on a daily basis. And, you know, I understand this is not an option for everybody, particularly people who start losing hair at a young age, like people in their teens and people in their early 20s. I mean, they may have to throw the kitchen sink at it. But if possible, I think it's best to just use finasteride alone. So number two. Use the foam instead of a liquid. The foam, in my experience, possibly due to the lack of propylene glycol, doesn't leave nearly as much residue and therefore doesn't cause nearly as many uh, minoxidil flakes. Now, the downside of the foam, of course, is that since it expands when it uh, goes onto the hair, a lot of it gets lost on the hair as opposed to getting on the scalp. And the best way to get around this is to liquefy the foam first and then applies it, apply it as you would liquid minoxidil. And I have a tutorial about how to do this, which I'll link below in the description. Now, number three, you can get a shower comb. Shower combs are, what they are is that they're densely packed with hard plastic brittles, uh, bristles, which work really well on wet hair and can be used to manually brush out a lot of the flakes. Uh, this is a strategy I've used for a long time and I find it works and it can also be used as a regular hairbrush when styling your hair, so I find them to be pretty useful. I mean, every time I shower, I'll just go ahead and just scrape my hair really uh, hard and then when I see like the dandruff buildup, I'll just go ahead and rinse it out with a shower faucet and I'll just keep going until like eventually uh, I don't see too many flakes anymore and that just takes like a few minutes every day so it's pretty convenient and very useful just to manually rub out those flakes so the fourth thing you can do is use minoxidil once per day as opposed to twice per day. This may seem counterintuitive since the package insert says you should use it twice daily, and this is based on the FDA uh, recommendations when minoxidil was first approved for male pattern baldness, I think back in like the 1980s. But one thing you have to keep in mind about the twice per day recommendation of topical minoxidil is that this is based on lonatin, which is oral minoxidil, which only has a half-life of about seven hours, which is why the initial clinical trials of topical minoxidil assumed it had to be used twice daily. As it turns out, though, topical minoxidil works a bit differently. What happens is that when you apply it to the scalp, it converts into its active form, minoxidil sulfate, via the enzyme sulfur transferase, and it then remains active on the scalp for 23 hours, which is why once per day usage is wholly appropriate. And that's why if you use it once per day, there's just less minoxidil on the scalp to cause buildup of flakes, which makes it much better if you want to try to avoid uh, dandruff, uh, minoxidil-induced dandruff, as you'd call it. So what I find to be a good strategy when you using minoxidil is to just use a liquefied minoxidil at night about an hour before bed to give it some time to dry and then I'll just wash my hair in the morning and I'll use the shower comb to get out any uh, dandruff and residual flakes and then just enjoy the rest of my day without having to worry about the negative cosmetic effect minoxidil causes. Although one thing I do want to bring up and I think is worth mentioning is that I do know at least some people who say they like what minoxidil foam does to their hair. They say it makes it kind of stand up like they're super saiyans and it works kind of like a mousse but in my experience, I think it kind of gives me that something about Mary looks, so I don't think it uh, looks very good. So I guess it's just an issue of personal preference, but moving on. All right, so lastly, another thing you can do is just try using less minoxidil and applying it to the problem areas as opposed to trying to saturate your scalp with it. If you're already on finasteride, then finasteride will certainly help you maintain what you haven't lost, and you can then use the minoxidil for more targeted hair loss. You can go ahead and target some of the stubborn areas where you're having problems, like the hairline, or maybe a bald spot in the back. I mean, minoxidil is a powerful growth stimulant, but if you're already on finasteride, there is no point in drenching your scalp with minoxidil. All you're doing is you're just creating more of a mess that you'll have to clean up later. But, um, you know, I don't want to give people the impression that I'm trying to discourage them from using minoxidil if they've already started. I mean, no matter what, you have to keep in mind, minoxidil is a lifetime commitment. I have seen many people, many people try to quit minoxidil for something else like finasteride or RU5 day for one, and it always ends in a complete disaster because the mechanism of minoxidil is different from other hair loss treatments. So if you're on minoxidil and you've gotten benefits from it, don't stop it because of the dandruff or else you'll lose all the benefits you've ever gained from it. Now, not everybody gets results from minoxidil. Some people don't have enough of the sulfur transferase, transferase enzyme on the scalp for minoxidil to convert it into its active form. So if you do use minoxidil and you haven't gotten any uh, results from it, then yeah, you can go ahead and drop it and then maybe consider like another growth stimulant like stamoxidine, which is a growth stimulant, but it works differently from minoxidil. So it's uh, something you can uh, 
use and maybe get results from if you don't get results from minoxidil. But um, anyways, you know, I know that treating dandruff isn't the same thing as fighting hair loss, but it's related in the sense that we want not only to have hair, but we also want to have hair that is cosmetically presentable. Hence why I think it's an important subject to talk about. And I hope you guys learned something from this video. Thank you for watching.